Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In this module on policies, today we will discuss a few ideas about right to health and universal health care in the context of India. Learners may be aware that in the Indian context, we have had uh, landmark enactments of Right to Education Act and the Right to Employment Act. It would be very useful to look at the interconnections of many of these acts uh, like the Right to Employment and Right to Education uh, in the context of rights based approaches to development because some of these discussions are extremely central to the economics of health and education. However, given the limited scope of this course, it may not be possible for us to look at the interconnections between different rights based uh, enactments of uh, employment, education and health and how they interact with each other in terms of impact on uh, various uh, socioeconomic uh, outcome indicators. Uh, but today in uh, this class, we will try to make up for some of these uh, discussions by bridging the gap on limitations of the course by uh, center staging the discussion on right to health and universal health care in the Indian context. Now, there are a lot of ideas in grey literature on social media blogs uh, by emerging new literature in the area of rights based uh, health care as well as uh, the concept of universal health care coverage. And of course, it gives rise to a lot of uh, ambiguity with regard to how we want to understand uh, public health outcomes or how we want to understand public health implementation measures. So, in this class, we will try to make an attempt to uh, streamline some of these different ideas that learners come across on different uh, mediums. I have planned this class as follows. First, we will understand the concept of public health. So far, we have been uh, studying about individual health outcomes and how individuals make a choice regarding their health status. Uh, but central to the study of uh, economics of health is also the idea of public health. For example, when we studied uh, disease burdens, uh, we will uh, see that uh, the disease patterns that are emerging in the country contexts has an important implication on social sector spending on uh, health sector for example. So, therefore, apart from individual health, public health concerns are also important to the economics of uh, health. Uh, we have also seen in the context of the economic categorization of public goods versus private goods that there is a lot of joint consumption when it comes to uh, goods such as uh, health and uh, education. So, it is in this context that uh, in this uh, policy session as well, it is useful for us to interrogate this idea of public health and what connections it has to this discussion on right to health and universal health care. Uh, following that, we will study about a very powerful framework brought forth by WHO, the World Health Organization, which is called the Social Determinants of Health Framework. And uh, following that, we will reflect on some of the social and political understanding of the term power and the connection of a certain type of power with uh, human rights agenda. The power conceptualization or concept is also embedded within the social determinants of health framework. And we will try to make a beginning to understand how uh, the conceptualization of power has taken place in uh, social and political literature and how it uh, can be integrated into the health frameworks as well. We will uh, look at whether India has a right to health act, what is universal health coverage and how far have we progressed, uh, what are India's initiatives towards universal health care coverage. And then finally, we will contextualize this entire discussion in the debate between privatization of healthcare sector in the wake of structural adjustment program in India in the 1990s and globalization and the increasing privateness of public health. When we come to the slide on uh, contextualizing this debate on privatization uh, versus uh, the maintaining uh, the core functions of public health, we will see what do we mean when I say uh, increasing privateness of public health and then finally, we will conclude this discussion. So, you can look at today's lecture as some sort of a general lecture where we are trying to tie together many of these different ideas that are there uh, on various medium and how we can uh, streamline many of these ideas and bring it into a, a coherent discussion. Now, what constitutes public health? We have of course, studied about public good which are jointly consumed. 
But now let us also understand what is this terminology referred to as public health. Basically, public health refers to a wide range of activities, policies, programs and services that are designed to prevent diseases, prolong life and promote health through collective and societal efforts because these have huge externalities, uh, often positive, sometimes negative. And because of these different externalities, it is important that there is collective action with regard to public health. It is largely concerned with protecting, improving and promoting the health and well-being of populations, communities and individuals through organized efforts and informed uh, choices. We can understand public health uh, by looking at some of the core functions of public health. So, for example, one of the core functions is assessment because there is a requirement of systematically collecting, analyzing and disseminating data about the health status of a community because we need to identify the health problems, the risk factors and then determine the resources needed to address these issues. So, there is a lot of assessment as far as, as one of the core functions of public health is concerned. Uh, the second core function could be policy development because if we have to deal with issues of public health, we need to formulate public policies that support the health of the population based on scientific evidence. And this involves creating policies that address specific health issues but with uh, externalities such as tobacco control, vaccination programs or access to clean water. And as you can see, these issues of tobacco control, vaccination or access to clean water are all jointly consumed or has huge externalities and therefore it has to be these issues have to be dealt with collectively. Uh, the third core function of public health is that of assurance. One has to ensure that necessary health services are available and accessible to the population either by providing services directly or by regulating and partnering with other organizations. One has to ensure quality and effectiveness of public health services which is an important element of the assurance function. So, there are three core functions of public health that we can think of. One is assessments, second is policy developments uh, so as to ensure that uh, specific health issues are addressed and then there is assurance of quality, ensuring quality and effectiveness of public health services and so on. There are of course many areas of public health and it is uh, impossible to collect all concerns of public health in uh, one class. But uh, some of the uh, key areas of public health can be highlighted as follows. Uh, so, for example, epidemiology is one uh, key area of public health which includes tracking disease outbreaks, uh, studying the causes and risk factors, evaluating the various kinds of interventions that have been initiated to deal or tackle these uh, issues. Environmental health is one uh, key area which basically uh, refers to studying the impact of pollution and climate change on health and developing strategies to mitigate these risks. Biostatistics is one example which includes designing studies, analyzing data, interpreting the results to inform public health decisions and policy. Health services administration is a very important area of uh, public health which refers to the entire uh, management of healthcare services, analysis of policy, uh, health service delivery, uh, maintenance of health service delivery. Uh, then there are issues regarding social and behavioral sciences as to how uh, social, cultural and behavioral factors influence health or address uh, social determinants of health. And then finally, there is studies of, on global health uh, which refers to pandemics and uh, global disease outbreaks, international health policies, uh, country collaborations in health management and so on. So, the focus areas of public uh, health is expansive and huge. And depending upon the context in which we are looking at public health, uh, we have to delineate the domain that we want to uh, focus on. Now, there is a very powerful framework that uh, was furnished by the World Health Organization, uh, which is referred to as the social uh, determinants of health framework of uh, understanding how different determinants impact health outcomes or how it impacts uh, equity in health and well-being. Now, if you look at this uh, figure here, there are two broad categories or determinants of uh, health uh, outcomes. One is referred to as structural determinants of health inequities and the other is intermediary determinants or social determinants of health. 
Now, when we talk in terms of a health system, we are mostly uh, inquiring into the material uh, circumstances of individuals or group of individuals, the way they live, they are their working conditions, whether food is available or not, how they are consuming their food, whether food absorption is taking place adequately or not. We are also looking at some of their behaviors and biological factors, how that is impacting their uh, health and well-being, uh, psychosocial factors and their impact on health and well-being. So, these are referred to some of the intermediary determinants or social determinants of health. But if you go back and then you see that there are other structural factors also that influence the intermediary determinants and that finally has an impact on equity in health and well-being. So, for example, the socio-economic and political context of a country is an important domain that uh, can impact the material conditions of living of an individual or a group of individual. The socio-economic and political context would include among many things governance models, macroeconomic policies for example, uh, what is the uh, percentage of GDP that is spent on uh, health sector in a country that has a tremendous influence on how it impacts the health outcomes or health delivery services in a country and then given the socio-economic or class position of a person or a group of persons, it can impact their health outcomes. Similarly, social policies relating to labor market, housing, land with regard to because these are all issues that impact uh, wages and incomes, uh, the affordability of goods and services in the market and uh, affordability of goods and services in the market in turn impacts the social conditions of living of individuals, the way the where they are born, where they live and they grow has huge impact from social policies of the country. Public policies on education, health and social protection are an important domain that influences the uh, intermediary determinants of material circumstances and so on. Of course, there are cultural and societal values that also work within the larger socio-economic and political context. So, as far as structural determinants are concerned, at the macro level, we have the socio-economic and political context that influences a lot of uh, material circumstances as far as the health system is concerned. Now, at the individual level, the socio-economic position of the individual or the group of individuals is also influenced by the socio-economic and political context as well as it influences the socio-economic and political context. So, if you see there are arrows going both ways here, the socio-economic position of a person is influenced by the socio-economic political context and this also in turn influences how different domains within the socio-economic and political context functions. So, as far as the socio-economic position of a person or a group of persons is concerned, often we get into a discussion about what is the social class of the individual, the gender, ethnicity. Uh, in the context of uh, India, we talk about caste issues, then there is uh, education, occupation and income. Generally, what we consider as are the socio-economic variables of individuals and how that impacts their material circumstances and that in turn impact having an impact on health and well-being. So, when we look at the structural determinants of health inequities which constitutes of the socio-economic and political context and the socio-economic position, the structural determinants impact the intermediary determinants or the social determinants of health which includes material conditions of living, uh, social and biological behaviors, psychosocial factors and all of these together uh, impacts uh, on equity in health and well-being. Uh, there is a lot of social cohesion and social capital issues as far as uh, both these uh, intermediary determinants and structural determinants are concerned. So, the WHO came up with the social determinants of health framework after years of experience of dealing with health systems across the world and there was a general consensus building among uh, globally that uh, without impacting or without dealing with the socio-economic and political context or the socio-economic position of individual or group of individuals, it is often not possible to bring about much changes within the health system. So, they are co-dependent, the socio-economic position of an individual, the social and economic and political context all influence how the health system uh, functions and therefore, there needs to be collective action at each of these levels that can uh, make so structural determinants positively uh, influence intermediary determinants and which is going to have long term impacts on health and well-being. 
So, uh, this is an important framework that forms uh, a conceptual uh, discussion or a conceptual uh, framework in the context of uh, right to health or universal health care. Uh, although right to health and universal health care are not similar concepts, they are different concepts and they need to be understood with regard to the debates surrounding uh, what is wrong with the health sector or what are the different uh, kinds of interventions that need to be uh, carried up, brought about in the health sector so that health services becomes affordable for all. Now, while discussing this uh, the social determinants of health framework, um, we must also pay some attention to the concept of power, the way it has been understood in social and political theory and how different social scientists have sort of interrogated with this concept of power and how to um, align the concept of power in the social determinants of health framework. Now, in social and political theory, the concept of power has traditionally been understood in two main ways. First is the concept of power two. This refers to the ability or capacity of a person or group to bring about change or make things happen. One can think of this as the power to act or make a difference. Uh, in fact, Sen talks about agency functions of individuals where agents become uh, their own change makers. So, it is more about potential and capacity rather than control over others. The other concept is power over and this refers to a more specific an often more politically important form of power because it means having the ability to control or dictate the action of others for some desired outcomes. And this idea of power is central to many modern theories of power focusing on how power is used to maintain control and enforce compliance. Now, domination and oppression may not always involve direct physical violence or explicit threats. It may be exerted in more subtle, indirect and covert ways. Now, why are we discussing about this concept of power to and power over? We will presently get to see that the concept of power is closely interconnected with the uh, human rights agenda, but we need to understand which concept of power is uh, connected to the uh, human rights agenda. Now, feminist theory has expanded the concept of power to include four types. Uh, one is power over, which we have seen as the ability to influence or coerce others often associated with domination, control or authority. Then there is power two, which is ability to organize and change existing hierarchies or systems. And this is more about empowerment and the ability to make a difference in one's own life or community. But there can also be power with, which is derived from collective action and represents the strength that comes from working together with others such as through cooperation, collaboration and solidarity. And then there is power within that comes from individual consciousness and self-awareness. This form of power is often associated with self-respect, self-worth and self-knowledge. Now, this different ways of understanding power can actually influence how development organizations work to empower women and other groups who have traditionally been marginalized or dominated. And this understanding of power has a very big influence on how health uh, resources or health sector needs to be organized in a country or in a community given that health leads to the affirmation of basic right to uh, live. For example, the power over approach focuses on increasing the participation of previously excluded or marginalized groups within existing economic and political structure. So, then the goal of analyzing a power structure as power over would be to integrate marginalized groups into the current system such as getting more women or disadvantaged groups involved in political decision making or economic activities that already exist. And this idea is to provide these groups with a voice and influence within the existing framework rather than changing or challenging the structure itself. And understanding power in this way leads to specific actions, for example, creating employment opportunities for women to participate in government, access jobs or receive education. This strategy leads to reduced exclusion and increased representation by enabling marginalized groups to participate more fully in established institutions and decision making process. Now, the concept of power as collective action, the way the feminist theory has uh, distinguished between the concept of power as collective action has a deep interconnection with human rights agenda. 
power as collective action is understood as something that can be exercised collectively by groups of people and this means power comes from working together to achieve common goals especially in the context of fighting against oppression and inequality. And this collective action to power connects well with the human rights model because human rights have always been about marginalized pressed groups coming together to demand their rights and seek justice. So, understanding power in this collective sense means that a human rights agenda is about more than just securing legal rights or protections for individuals, it is about supporting the collective efforts of historically dominated or marginalized communities. Now, it is in this context now then uh, let us uh, move our discussion towards uh, whether or not India has a right to health act and what are the, um, what are the discussions surrounding this area. So far what we have seen is that um, uh, public health as a concept requires collective action, requires collective support uh, and because uh, as a good also public health is closer to a public good because it is many of the aspects of public health are jointly consumed and has joint consumption characteristics therefore it requires collective action not necessarily only from the government but different kinds of collaborative partners. Uh, in this context we also saw the um, uh, very powerful framework of uh, social determinants of health where health is not just or the health outcome is not just a function of uh, the health system but it is also a function of the um, structural determinants of health and structural determinants of health are uh, dependent upon the larger socio-economic and political context of a country as well as the socio-economic position of the individual concerned whose health we are talking about or the group of individuals in the social position, the socio-economic position of group of individuals concerned. So, it is both structural determinants and social determinants of health which ultimately impacts the uh, equity considerations regarding health and well-being which is referred to as structural determinants and intermediate determinants in the overall framework of social determinants of health. And then we saw that the concept of power is embedded within this uh, framework, the social determinants of health framework because it requires collective action at various domains, in various domains or at various levels to be able to bring about uh, change as far as health outcomes is concerned. Now, the Indian government, uh, although there have been many debates, discussions and proposals to establish such an act to make health a legally enforceable right in India, uh, we have not enacted a right to health act in lines of the right to education act of 2009. Uh, as far as the states are concerned, the government of Rajasthan so far has been the first and only state in India to enact a right to health act in 2023. And there have been many controversies surrounding this right to health act as well. Interested learners may follow up on some of the articles and uh, popular writings that have emerged in the context of uh, right to health act of Rajasthan to understand what are the issues of different stakeholders in enforcing a right to uh, health act. And that will also give us some ideas as to what are the issues that need to be sorted out for enforcing a right to health act in the context of India as well. Now, although we do not have a right to health act enacted in our country, we have legal frameworks and initiatives related to health in India. For example, there are some constitutional provisions that inform about uh, right to health. So, the constitution of uh, India does not explicitly mention the right to health as a fundamental right, but we have several provisions under the uh, directive principles of state policy and judicial interpretations by the Supreme Court uh, that has contributed to recognizing right to health as an implicit part of right to life. Article 21 right to life and personal liberty has been interpreted by the Supreme Court to include the right to health and access to medical facilities. Uh, there are many cases that, ha that can be cited uh, which has ruled that the right to life includes the right to health. But we have not had any direct mention about right to health in the uh, constitutional provisions as well. Article 47 of the directive principles directs the state to improve public health and nutrition and standard of living which underlines the importance of health in governance. 
In the class on uh, national uh, policies regarding health, we touched upon the national health policy of 2017, which is a very important document that outlines the government's vision for universal health coverage. Now, universal health coverage and right to health act are not the same. Uh, however, universal health coverage also has a very wide scope including a lot of health care services uh, that are beneficial for the uh, community at large. But we will contextualize this discussion surrounding uh, right to health and universal health care towards the end of the uh, lesson today. So, the NHP 2017 aims to provide comprehensive primary health care. The focus, the highlight is on the word comprehensive here. It provides comprehensive primary health care, which includes a lot of facilities. It includes preventive health care and promotive health care, uh, reducing out of pocket expenses and ensuring that quality of health care is accessible to all. But the NHP 27 does not confer a legally enforceable right to health. There are of course various health schemes and initiatives that have been launched, for example, the Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana, which aims to provide health insurance coverage to economically vulnerable populations. There are various state specific health schemes such as the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister's Comprehensive Health Insurance Scheme. Uh, there is a scheme in Rajasthan, there is a scheme in Maharashtra, Odisha has had a scheme on health insurance, a uh, state initiative on health insurance which provides similar kind of health coverage. We have a draft National Public Health Act which is aimed at consolidating various public health laws into a comprehensive framework uh, which is a significant step towards better health governance but it is not the same as establishing a right to health act uh, in India. Now, uh, with this background then now let us uh, try to understand this concept of universal health coverage. We now know that uh, right to health act is a more uh, justiciable or enforcement of uh, 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 legal backing uh, provided to seeking uh, health care in a country. In India we still do not have a right to health act but instead what we see uh, in the larger literature on health care is the reference to the term universal health coverage. Now, let us pay some attention to what does this concept mean and what are the initiatives that um, have been in place in India towards achieving universal health coverage and what is the importance of looking at universal health coverage within the larger context of um, cutback on social sector expenditure in the context of uh, globalization and structural adjustment program of the 1990s and the current uh, scenario of pursuing sustainable development goals by 2030 with regard to achieving uh, universal health coverage. So, this concept of universal health coverage basically has evolved over time and it has been shaped by various global, regional and national health initiatives, social movements and policy frameworks. How do we define this? We define this as uh, something that ensures all individuals and communities with accessing full range of essential health services which needs to be promotive in nature, preventive, curative, rehabilitative and palliative without suffering financial hardship. So, promotive would mean uh, looking at uh, social behavioral change of individuals within a community. Uh, so, uh, preventive would mean uh, ensuring that uh, there are no disease outbreaks or there are ensuring that many social ills are contained so that it does not lead to uh, future uh, ill health or health challenges. Uh, curative of course uh, refers to providing uh, access to, uh, to curative services, uh, rehabilitative and palliative dealing with uh, uh, with the uh, management of uh, diseases and accessing all of these services of course requires uh, a lot of uh, financial expenses on the part of individuals. But if we equate the concept of having access to health uh, with the right to life or rights based approach to development, then the uh, idea of uh, ensuring that this happens without suffering financial hardship becomes central to the discussion about health uh, services. So, it is in this context that universal health care coverage is some sort of a midway between the two extremes of ensuring or enforcing right to health on the one hand and uh, uh, putting the onus on accessing health care services entirely on individuals on the other. 
Uh, the genesis of UHC can be traced through several key historical milestones, global health movements and policy developments. This is not exactly a very new concept. Uh, there is a historical uh, background to the concept of universal health coverage. So, let us uh, try to look at some of the early foundations in 19th and 20th century that gave rise to this concept of universal health coverage and it is often discussed in the context of the literature on health economics. The uh, two important models that uh, hold uh, sway in the context of health coverage is what is called the Bismarck model and the beverage model. I have made references to these two models when we discussed insurance uh, module in uh, this course. However, let us come back to this uh, these two models uh, briefly uh, because it has uh, relevance in the larger context of universal health coverage and health policy and health systems in the context of public health. So, the origins of universal health coverage can be linked to early social health insurance models developed in Europe. In the late 19th century, Germany's Chancellor Bismarck introduced the first modern social health insurance system in 1883, which mandated health insurance for workers through employer and employee contributions. And this model is known as the Bismarck model, which laid the groundwork for social health insurance systems in many European countries. So, many of these European countries which have made tremendous advancements in terms of their health outcomes uh, owe it to uh, these kinds of understanding about how uh, health uh, systems should be uh, designed and built and the social health insurance system has a uh, deep history in the context of Western European countries which seems to have impacted uh, their health outcomes in the modern times. Similarly, in 1940s, the United Kingdom established the beverage model with the creation of the National Health Service in 1948 and this NHS was based on the principle of universal coverage providing free health care at the point of use for all residents but funded primarily through taxation. And this model emphasized healthcare as a public good and influenced the development of publicly funded health systems in other countries. So, in the German model, we have social health insurance kind of a model and the uh, beverage model is a kind of a public taxation model as individuals we are paying for our own services, uh, healthcare, but it is uh, taking place through the, uh, through the root of the government. Now, the International Labour Organization also has had an impact on uh, health coverage uh, concept because the ILO began advocating for social protection and health insurance as a part of its mission to improve working conditions and workers' rights. So, the ILO's efforts included promoting health insurance as a means to protect workers from economic hardships due to illnesses. In the post Second World War period when priority started uh, being given to global health, the importance of uh, World Health Organization and its uh, primacy given to the concept of right to health needs to be mentioned here. The WHO was established in 1948 and the mandate was to promote health and well-being uh, worldwide and the constitution of WHO enshrined health as a fundamental human right. So, this sort of changed the discourse surrounding access to health. Uh, the uh, WHO's enshrinement of health as a fundamental human right uh, started uh, making a move uh, towards uh, ensuring that health systems uh, take it upon themselves to ensure that health is available to all when they need as a matter of right and not just as a matter of choice. So, the WHO's reference was to enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health as one of the fundamental rights of every human being. In this context, the 1978 Alma-Ata Declaration on Primary Health Care is extremely important in the literature on health and also in the uh, progress that uh, globally that we have made on health care services. In 1978, the Alma-Ata Declaration on Primary Health Care adopted the International Conference on Primary Health Care called for Health for All by the year 2000, 
which became some sort of a clarion call for how different countries across the world should organize their health services for ensuring health for all by the year 2000. It was some kind of a millennium development goal. So, this declaration emphasized the importance of uh, primary health care as a means to achieve universal health coverage and reduce health inequalities and it highlighted the need for comprehensive, accessible and community based health services as essential to achieving universal health care. So, the Alma Atta declaration of health for all became some sort of a guiding source or a guiding factor for ensuring that uh, primary health services in uh, the developing countries at least receive a lot of policy attention and receive a lot of government support for building of these essential health services or primary health care infrastructure so as to ensure that universal health coverage uh, is provided to all and it should also lead to reduction of health inequalities. Now, there was a lot of expansion of social health protection in the 20th century. For example, uh, there were development of social health insurance and national health systems. Throughout the 20th century, many countries expanded their social health insurance systems or developed national health services to provide coverage for their population. For example, countries like Canada, Japan, Sweden and France developed their own versions of health systems based on principles of universality and equity. And these developments were often motivated by the recognition of health as a social right and the need to provide access to health care services as a public good. So, different countries adopted various models to achieve UHC, sometimes social insurance, sometimes tax funded systems and often with mixed approaches of both social insurance and tax funded systems. So, you can think of India as having some kind of a mixed system where we have the best of or some of both of these uh, kinds of systems where we have social insurance in the form of Ayushman Bharat today and we have also uh, historically had some uh, tax funded systems, but India is also one of the countries where the out of pocket expenditures on health has historically been very high. Now, somewhere around 2000s, there was a global consensus and renewed focus on UHC. So, we started talking about Millennium Development Goals. In the early 2000s, these MDGs were uh, formulated to reduce poverty and uh, improve health outcomes by 2015 and specific targets were fixed, for example, for reduction of child mortality, improving maternal health, combating infectious diseases. In fact, in the context of India, many of you who have studied other papers in economics, particularly Indian economy, you would uh, recall that through the 2000s and the 1990s, there was a lot of focus on bringing down the infant mortality rates or child mortality rates and maternal mortality rates, which then became important uh, development goals to achieve. Uh, for uh, reduction of health inequalities by uh, providing robust uh, primary health care facilities in uh, rural and urban areas. So, MDG has highlighted the importance of strengthening the health systems and expanding access to care. Many global health initiatives also started during this period. For example, Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, Malaria, Global Alliance for Vaccines as a global health partnership. And all of these uh, partnerships or initiatives basically drew attention to the significance of health because health started becoming an important uh, driver of health inequities uh, post uh, globalization or structural adjustment program and cutbacks to social sectors in many countries across uh, the world. So, then the issue of health financing uh, started getting center stage. Uh, but within the larger commitment to provide universal health care coverage to all. So, then what is the best form of providing health care services? What are the different kinds of financing uh, or sources of financing of health care started uh, began taking uh, a center stage? Now, it is in this context that we must also discuss the World Health Assembly resolutions and WHO's leadership. In 2005, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution calling on member states to develop health financing systems to achieve universal health coverage. So, the resolution highlighted the need for health systems to be designed to provide all people with access to essential services without financial help. And the WHO continued to advocate for UHC as a priority by emphasizing its role in achieving health equity, 
promoting sustainable development and improving population health outcomes. It is in this context we must also emphasize on the sustainable development goals which are the major uh, development agenda as of now. The SDGs were adopted in 2015 and they marked a pivotal moment for UHC. Goal 3 of the SDGs explicitly aims to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. There is a target 3.8 which specifically focuses on achieving universal health coverage which means it uh, center stages the idea of financial risk protection and access to uh, quality essential health services, affordable essential medicines, vaccines and all of these fall within the domain of financing for health which is an important uh, policy matter for all countries. These SDGs also provided a comprehensive framework for integrating UHC into global development efforts and mobilizing international support for achieving health coverage for all. So, what we have seen so far is that the right to health as a concept and universal health care coverage as a concept are two different concepts. Uh, the uh, right to health ensures provision of health services to people as an enforceable right as a legally enforceable right, but universal health coverage is some sort of a commitment by the governments across the world to ensure that there is not much financial hardship suffered by people. So, one of the primary objectives is to ensure that out of pocket expenditures are reducing and governments across the world are making an attempt to make healthcare services more affordable and uh, reachable to uh, different sections of the community. So, globally there have been many regional and national advocacies uh, for uh, UHC, uh, various regional bodies and initiatives have played a crucial role in promoting uh, UHC. For example, the African Union and its member states have made commitments to achieving UHC as part of their broader health and development strategies. And the Pan American Health Organization has advocated for UHC and supporting countries in developing policies and programs. There are many national movements and reforms in countries such as Thailand, Rwanda, Mexico and Ghana. They have made significant progresses in achieving near universal health coverage uh, by including various models whether social health insurance, tax based financing or community based health insurance schemes. Now, let us focus uh, some attention on what has been India's efforts towards achieving uh, universal health coverage. In India, we have a right to education act, we have a right to employment act, but we still do not have a right to health act. The Indian government is committed to universal health coverage and in the uh, last uh, uh, decade, there have been uh, many efforts towards achieving the universal health coverage. So, let us, uh, we have had a discussion on the NHP of 2017, but we can also look at NHP, the National Health Policy of 2017 as one of the efforts towards achieving UHC. So, it represents the NHP basically represents a significant step towards UHC because it aims to provide comprehensive primary health care services and those who are working in the health sector would know that this comprehensive primary health care services is a package of services that is available to uh, members of the community at the uh, primary health care centers level or at the health and wellness centers uh, in uh, rural areas and urban areas, which is basically a package uh, referring to providing preventive and promotive health care services and in some cases even curative health care services. And uh, the comprehensive primary health care services package is aimed to reduce out of pocket expenditures and move towards a more equitable and affordable health care system. The NHP emphasizes preventive and promotive health care, integrated service delivery and strengthening of health systems. And all of these concepts have a lot of uh, these uh, terminologies, integrated service delivery, strengthening of health systems has a lot of importance in the context of the study of health systems. The NHP 2017 has also set targets for improving health outcomes such as reducing maternal mortality, increasing life expectancy, enhancing access to essential medicines and diagnostics, uh, strategies for improving healthcare financing, enhancing health workforce capacity and promoting health research. So, in that sense, NHP 2017 policy documents is a significant effort towards achieving universal health coverage. 
Similarly, we have the social insurance scheme known as the Ayushman Bharat which was launched in 2018 and it is uh, uh, believed to be one of the world's largest health insurance schemes aiming to provide free secondary and tertiary care hospitalization coverage uh, to over 100 million vulnerable families. The scheme focuses on providing cashless and paperless access to services across public and private hospitals in India. But of course, there are differences in the way this program is implemented because uh, health is a state subject as well and therefore, uh, many state governments, uh, they have their own health insurance programs which have been implemented. So, it is not necessary that this uh, uh, national level policy has been implemented in all the states, but uh, many states have taken up uh, this uh, program and uh, one needs to have assessments at the uh, ground level to see what has been the impact of such a policy. But the effort towards achieving UHC is that at least we have a social health insurance policy now with the aim of providing universal health care coverage. As I was mentioning that there are many state specific health insurance schemes as well apart from the PMJAY or the Prime Minister Jan Arogya Yojana. So, we have uh, schemes in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, Odisha, Rajasthan who that offer various levels of health insurance coverage to uh, state residents. Uh, similarly, uh, one of the unique uh, introductions to the uh, health system is what is referred to as the health and wellness centers as part of Ayushman Bharat program. This is uh, basically a part of comprehensive primary health care services. Uh, these uh, health and wellness centers aim to transform the existing sub centers and primary health centers into comprehensive care providers. And uh, currently, many of these have already undergone changes in many states of the country. Uh, new HWCs are also set up in many states. And uh, the focus has been on delivering a broader range of services beyond maternal and child health. Uh, before the implementation of the health and wellness centers, uh, the number of uh, primary health centers uh, or the number of sub centers in the rural areas uh, were very few in number. But one of the focus of uh, towards uh, em ensuring universal health care coverage, one of the important additions to the uh, health setup in the country has been uh, the infrastructure of health and wellness centers where the focus is no longer only on uh, child and uh, mother health, but also on various non-communicable diseases, uh, mental health, geriatric care, palliative care, uh, providing free drugs and diagnostics in many states and so on. The HWCs are designed to provide universal, free and comprehensive primary health care uh, including preventive, promotive, curative and rehabilitative services. Thereby, it reduces the need for secondary and tertiary care services. There is also a lot of focus on uh, strengthening the health infrastructure. Uh, we have had the National Rural Health Mission in India, but since 2012-13, the National Health Mission which with convergence of the NRHM and the National Urban Health Mission uh, has uh, come into place which aims to improve healthcare delivery across India which of course includes the rural areas but also the underserved urban areas. And there are many key components of the NHM primarily being uh, improving maternal and child health, combating communicable, non-communicable diseases, enhancing human resource capacity in the health sector and there are many developments that have taken place in this uh, uh, domain in many states across uh, India. New infrastructure development is one of the important effort in India towards achieving universal health coverage. There is of course many public health programs and disease specific initiatives. It is not possible to cover many of these initiatives within the uh, scope of today's class, but it will suffice to say that many national programs for communicable and non-communicable diseases have been initiated and sustained. Uh, immunization and maternal child health as part of universal immunization program, the records with regard to immunization and vaccination among children in India is one of the best in the world currently. Uh, we have programs like uh, the Janani Suraksha Yojana and many more programs such as the Pradhan Mantri Surakshit Matritva Abhiyan. All of these initiatives have been taken up to ensure that last mile services are provided to the underserved population 
and uh, depending upon the health governance structures of the state, some state governments have made tremendous progress in some of these initiatives while others are lagging behind. And uh, it, uh, the uh, health initiatives are deeply connected to governance structures and uh, the well performing governance structures have made some uh, great progresses in some of these initiatives. Towards uh, achieving uh, universal health coverage, the national digital health mission is uh, uh, one of the uh, important uh, initiatives because it aims to create a digital health ecosystem that integrates healthcare providers and patients by enabling better access to health services, efficient management of health records and effective monitoring of health outcomes. The digital health mission includes many initiatives such as creation of unique health IDs for individuals, establishment of digital health registries, telemedicine services, electronic health records and all of these together go towards improving health outcomes. So, there are many such initiatives taken place in different states of the country and there are visible progresses in the primary health centers uh, in rural as well as urban areas with regard to the national digital health mission. There are of course regulatory reforms and quality assurance. India has implemented regulatory frameworks to ensure quality and safety of health services such as the Clinical Establishments Act uh, which mandates the registration and regulation of all clinical establishments to improve quality of care. There are initiatives like National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers. Uh, there are many community based health programs which started along with the National Rural Health Mission. There are ASHAs to promote health awareness, encourage health seeking behavior and facilitate access to health services particularly in rural and underserved areas. Now, there are initiatives also towards reducing out of pocket expenditure because historically India was one of the countries which had actually experienced very uh, high out of pocket expenditures on uh, on uh, healthcare. Uh, so, th there has been some increase in public health expenditure uh, in India, although the aim is to increase public health expenditure by more. Uh, financial risk protection in the form of social health insurance has also been initiated to ensure that it provides some cushion to the out of pocket expenditure uh, problem among the Indian population. So, if one has to summarize some of India's initiatives towards uh, the commitment of universal health coverage, uh, you can think of Ayushman Bharat scheme, the national health policy of 2017, the national health mission which combines both the NRHM and the NUHM, then there are state specific health insurance scheme, and the national digital health mission to ensure effectiveness and smooth functioning of the systems for uh, improving health outcomes. There are various public health programs and disease specific initiatives and there are various community based health initiatives and in the last uh, decade or so a uh, lot of uh, improvements and progresses are being seen in the context of uh, health outcome uh, uh, delivery of health services in the country. However, uh, one must acknowledge the fact that we still do not have a right to health act wherein health becomes a justiciable or an enforceable, uh, uh, enforceable uh, act in the uh, country. Now, after uh, navigating this discussion around uh, public health, the public good characteristics of public health, uh, the uh, connection of uh, rights based agenda and uh, social determinants of health model of public health. Uh, let me sort of uh, try to end this discussion by contextualizing the debate on uh, public health and privateness of uh, public health. Now, this began with the structural adjustment program and health spending in India. In the 1990s, because of the structural adjustment program, various kinds of cutbacks in social sector spending was initiated and that included the health sector. In this context, uh, the UNICEF in the 1990s observed something very important. Uh, to quote, it said, great change is in the air as the 1990s begin and great change is needed if a century of unprecedented progress is not to end in a decade of decline and despair for half the nations of the world. In many countries, poverty, child malnourishment and ill health are advancing again after decades of steady retreat. And although the reasons are many and complex, overshadowing all is the fact that the governments of the developing world as a whole have now reached the point of devoting half of their total annual expenditure to the maintenance of military and the servicing of debt. 
So, herein lies the trade off between uh, health expenditure uh, and the expenditure on other goods and services. The classic economic problem of uh, trade off between uh, goods that are necessities or spending on goods that meet other criteria. Now, let us contextualize this further. What is the connection here? Why are we talking about the structural adjustment program and cutback on spending and how the uh, commitment to universal health coverage came in in the larger context of rights based agenda uh, discussion with regard to health. Now, this is where the inherent principle of public health needs to be brought in. The inherent principle of public health is that it is a public good meaning that the benefits are uh, jointly uh, shared are shared by more than one member. So, the health outcomes are shared and their accumulation lead to better conditions of living among people. But this policy, the economic package of structural adjustment program advised for a cutback on social sector expenditure and reduced some of the inherent public good characteristics of public health and moved towards health being more of a private good which is why out of pocket expenditures on health started rising. Now, in this context you will recall our discussion on health as human capital or health as human right. In the beginning of this course we initiated this discussion about whether health and education should be seen only as human capital or it is a human right as well and we concluded as part of those lectures that it has to be a human right as well although it is human capital too we cannot uh, underestimate the importance of looking at health and education as human right. It is in this context that I would uh, request uh, learners to recall the World Bank's World Development Report of 1993 investing in health and that needs to be posited in this discussion regarding WHO's commitment to universal health care coverage and many developing countries commitments towards universal health care coverage. Now, in 1987 the World Bank furnished a document titled Financing Health Services in Developing Countries which recommended a list of advisories for developing countries. Some of these advisories were increase amounts paid by patients which means the public the publicness characteristic of public health was reduced and the privateness characteristics were increased which means that the burden of spending on uh, health uh, started being more on patients themselves, but this has to be contextualized in the larger context of the epidemiological uh, situation of uh, countries such as India, where we still saw a large number of maternal deaths, child deaths, infant deaths, life expectancy was not as high as it was is, it is now or as high as uh, was already being experienced in developed countries such as in Japan and so on. And it is in this context that one uh, needs to see uh, how uh, also infectious disease uh, uh, incidence was very high, communicable diseases were very high. So, these are diseases which has huge negative externalities. So, it is in this context that one has to understand that the consumption of these goods are joint or in other words it has huge externalities. So, then it is in this context that one needs to ask was it desirable that the amount to be paid by the patients should be increased or not. Similarly, there were advisories regarding developing private health insurance mechanisms or expanding participation of private sector in health, decentralized government health care services and fix responsibility of health outcomes on local communities. The World Development Report titled Investing in Health in 1993 further fine tuned these recommendations by providing elaborate prescriptions on how to cut back state expenditure. And as a result, the burden of maintaining health outcomes fell on people themselves. But developing countries such as India still had a high burden of communicable diseases, which had huge negative externalities on the society at large. Social determinants of health played an important role in impacting health outcomes. And without investing in social determinants, the road to universal health coverage became a distant dream. So, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cutbacks and setbacks after the implementation of the structural adjustment program which brought back WHO's position or strengthened WHO's position as some sort of a midway between the World Bank prescriptions of cutback on social sector expenditure and the uh, position of uh, rights based approaches to development by ensuring that right to health becomes an act. Uh, it is in this uh, context that 
the commitment to universal health coverage becomes an important uh, policy attention uh, in the context of countries such as India. Now, to understand this debate between increased privatization of the health sector and the rise in out of pocket expenditures while recognizing that health is a human right and that all countries should commit to universal health coverage, it is important to examine the details of India's health sector reforms during the 1990s and 2000s. However, a thorough discussion of this topic is beyond the scope of the present course on the economics of health and education. So, in this class what we have tried to do is to uh, provide a context to the, to the discussion on right to health and universal health care coverage as far as India is concerned. We began understanding uh, the, the uh, concept of public health, we saw what are the uh, core functions of public health, what are the key areas of public health and given the discussion that we have had earlier in the course regarding the uh, publicness characteristics of good or privateness characteristics of good, it is easy for us to understand that public health has public characteristics because many of the outcomes are jointly shared and therefore it requires some sort of a collective action. We also got introduced to the social determinants of health framework wherein we saw that when we understand health outcomes or um, the impact on uh, of policies on health outcomes, we do not just think of health system in isolation from all other systems. We think of a health system as integrated with the social and political fabric of a country. So, we talk about uh, structural determinants of health care and we talk about intermediate determinants of health care. What we see in the context of uh, material conditions of living or social and biological factors that contribute to uh, health uh, outcomes in a country are basically intermediate factors. But we must also understand that these intermediate factors are informed by the larger socio-political context of the country uh, which includes uh, social policies on education and health, which includes the macroeconomic conditions with regard to how much we are spending on health and so on. It also refers to cultural and societal values. Uh, then there is the social and economic position of the individual concerned within the society and how these uh, larger socio-economic political factors influences the social and economic position of an individual or a group of individuals. So, all of these factors taken together which we are referring to as structural characteristics or structural determinants also influences the health system. Now, when we discussed the uh, framework of uh, social determinants of health, we saw that the concept of power is very important. Power is often understood in the context of coercive power or power to bring about change. The feminist discourse has brought about various other forms of power discussions where it talks about collective action. Collective action is important in the context of social determinants of health because the changes that needs to be brought about in structural determinants or intermediate determinants cannot take place in an isolated manner. There has to be collaborations at various levels, collective action at various levels to bring about impact on uh, health outcomes and it is in this context that the important interconnection with a rights based agenda to health. Uh, is established. In the context of India, we have seen that although we have had a right to education act and a right to employment act, so far we have not had a right to health act. Although there have been discussions and debates surrounding the right to health act, Rajasthan is the only state in India which has seen the implementation of the right to health act in 2023. Although there are controversies surrounding this and I encourage the learner to look up what are the controversies to understand the context of public health and the uh, views of different stakeholders that needs to be discussed in the context of a right to health act. Then we looked at the universal health care coverage which is the most important terminology in the current times with regard to public health because it brings the focus on health care financing. Uh, many countries across the world are committed to the idea of universal health care coverage. It is some sort of a midway between uh, complete withdrawal of the state from social sector like the health sector or being able to uh, implement an enforceable justiciable right to health act. And there are many uh, elements of the universal health care coverage which actually is slightly tilted towards the uh, positively tilted towards the social determinants of health framework 
or the right to health framework because many initiatives are implemented which uh, which brings the healthcare services closer to the community although the gap is not completely bridged because of the absence of a rights based agenda in uh, social health. Then we saw that uh, India has in the last one decade made uh, some progresses towards universal health coverage because we have a social health insurance program currently in place. We have various kinds of reforms as far as health infrastructure is concerned such as the health and wellness centers. Uh, there are uh, reforms with regard to health workforce, uh, healthcare institutions, increasing healthcare institutions, increasing community involvement as far as health uh, outcome is concerned. And then finally, we tried to contextualize this entire discussion by bringing back the discussion on prescription of World Bank of looking at health as an investment and not as a human right. So, this debate continues, there is an ongoing discussion and debate surrounding these two different worldviews of looking at health as an investment or health as a human right. But for the time being, while we are settling the scores with regard to health as human right or health as human capital, universal health care coverage comes in as some sort of a midway between these two extreme views and provides various kinds of uh, programs and policies that uh, uh, ensures that the health outcomes of vulnerable sections of population are improved. So, this is the Indian context to a right to health uh, and universal health coverage. For this uh, lesson, I have taken a few references. Uh, I have studied in detail uh, the paper by Amit Sengupta on health in the age of globalization. Uh, the WHO conceptual framework or actions on the social determinants of health is available online and I would encourage learners to uh, read uh, this document very carefully. It is a very enlightening document on uh, the understanding of power and social determinants of health and the impact all of these have on universal health coverage. I have also studied the India's national health policy 2017 which is publicly available and the international human right to health a paper by S. T. Jamar the 1994 paper which gave some views about how to understand the international human right to health. Uh, I hope uh, the learners will uh, benefit from this discussion on uh, uh, right to health and universal health coverage and those who are interested to pursue further research on uh, these areas may want to look up these uh, links and references in more detail. So, I will see you in the next class. Thank you. Mm -hmm.